Welcome to the book show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Warren Groff's new novel, The Vaster Wilds, is at once an adventure story and a fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. A servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement in the wilderness. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the spark of God that burns hot within her. What she finds is beyond the limits of her imagination and will bend her belief in everything that her own civilization has taught her. The Vaster Wilds tells the story of America in miniature through one girl at a hinge point in history. Lauren Groff is a three-time National Book Award finalist and the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Monsters of Templeton, Arcadia, Fates and Furies, and Matrix, and the short story collections Delicate Edible Birds and Florida. Again, the new novel is The Vaster Wilds, and it is a great pleasure to welcome Lauren Groff back to this week's book show. How are you? So well. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to be on the book show, Joe. Thank it's you. It's wonderful to, uh, to have you here. From my understanding, this book was underway and then your last book, The Matrix, came in and took over. And then this one went went to the side for a little while. And then you returned to it. Sort of, yes. I mean, that's pretty much what happened. But I actually wrote them at the same time. <laughs> so it's, it, and with a third one as well. Uh, but yes, uh, I didn't realize that I was writing all three together until Matrix came and just sort of... Um, blew my brain up uh, and and took over for a minute but I was I was still working on the Vaster Wilds as I was doing Matrix. So the Vaster Wilds was the one that came first then. Well the idea was first. Yes. And then yes. Yeah, but I was actually finished with Matrix first. It's just sometimes books take, you know, 10 years to write. This I'm, one took only 5. I'm interested in the idea that that sort of spawned it all. Well, in 2012, I was in a doctor's office and I picked up a Smithsonian magazine and there's this article on Jamestown, especially the starving time, where I believe there was evidence uh, in the article that um, said that one of the, the young girls whose bones were disinterred showed evidence of cannibalism. And so I carried that around with me for a while. Until I reread Robinson Crusoe and I thought about early American captivity narratives and all of these elements came together and exploded into my idea for this book. Did it come to you? Because we certainly have read this adventure story from a male perspective. And what was it that you felt that was missing from that story? That's exactly it. I, you know, I did want to write a female Robinson Crusoe. Uh, I also wanted to take early American captivity narratives, which were generally the voices of women as told to men of the church, right? So Cotton Mather, his father, Increase Mather, collected these captivity narratives of women who were kidnapped by Native American tribes and then ransomed back to their their families for money. And these narratives were these deeply political, deeply propagandistic things used to justify westward expansion and to justify the genocide of Native Americans. And so they were, they were both really fascinating cultural artifacts and really disturbing cultural artifacts. And I thought that there was something really rich in them that I could take uh, and write an anti-captivity narrative in some ways in my book. What goes into that of an anti-captivity narrative? Well, it's a questioning what my protagonist is being captive to, right? And, and some of the ideas that she was raised within. For instance, so she is, we don't exactly know how old she is because she doesn't right. know how old she is. Because she was a foundling. She was discovered a newborn in a, a terrible part of London and brought to one of the local, I guess, the hospitals and brought up to four years old and then shipped out to a family as girls were, foundlings were, to become an indentured servant, even at four years old, if you can imagine. So this girl is raised within this puritanical tradition where she knows because she is female, she is poor, she has no family, she's a servant, she is not of the elect. Uh, the people of the elect at the time, people believed that um, they were of the elect because God bestowed them with material goods, right? With that God showed that they were worthy of 
coming to heaven because they were male. Women couldn't go to heaven. Um, so she she has internalized all of these ideas of herself and her God and her people and the people of the Americas. All of these ideas hold her captive in a certain way. And through the course of the book, I love to believe that she strips them off her like unwanted clothing <laughs> and she's going through the book. You have the girl observing indigenous people. They are present in the book. That in and of itself allows us to think of of what the perceptions are. Through this character, we have what's going through her mind of what the girl sees and what is part of the wilderness. Yes, correct, right. But, you know, of course, I I didn't feel as though the story of indigenous people there of the time where it was my story necessarily to tell. And it's not the story that the book wanted me to tell either. They, it really wanted me to tell the story of, I guess, the girl's unknowing complicity in some of the colonial aspects that she's in, right? Because just the mere fact of her presence on the continent uh, means she's a participant in uh, colonization and she she comes to understand that as well over time. There's this one moment in the book where the girl is on a boat that she found. It was, it's a long story. <laughs> she's on a boat and yes. she's coming up the Chesapeake. Right. And she sees these two young girls playing with a puppy and uh, the girls sort of look at her like she's this gaunt person sliding by on a boat. And my protagonist um, believes that these girls will remember her forever for being such a, like, a strange sight. But that, of course, is, is a little bit arrogant right? to believe that uh, she's, she's so unusual. She's going to haunt their imagination for the rest of their life. And they don't think of her ever again. Um, in the books, this is a small moment of irony happening there. As you're writing about the boat, there there are moments where a dream will come in. Uh, there's moments where she wakes and the, the water is, is leaking into the boat. It does go back and forth into her various states of, of, for want of a better term, consciousness. Oh, yeah. The whole book does in some ways, right? Yes. It's, it's going in and out. I really love the omniscient third person. I think it's really extraordinary so that not only can you be really close in the mind of this protagonist, you can also then make these wild leaps outward and almost go into a hawk's eye view of the world and then come down in a different place. I think it's really fun to do so. You have this young woman. We don't know much about her background, but we we do see her come to terms with nature and what she knows about nature and what she knows about civilization and what she knows about religion and shedding a lot of that and realizing a new truth along the way on this journey. Yeah. I like to think of this book as my propulsive page turning philosophical novel. <laughs> so it's, 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 it is a book that's deeply invested in ideas, but it's yes. also deeply invested in this survival story, which is one of the most uh, major gut uh, like level stories you could possibly tell. I wanted both to be happening because that's what's happening to her as well, right? I have this um, this idea that the book has a, a chiastic structure, a structure shaped like an X, whereas her body is sort of descending into the travails of going through the wilderness of running, of starving, of trying to find food and water, it's sort of descending, but her spirit is sort of anagogically inclined upward. It's going toward the heavens in some ways. So even as things get pretty bleak uh, materially, spiritually, they become kind of ecstatic and glorious. I wanted both things to exist at the same time. Lauren Groff is our guest on this week's book show. The name of the new novel is The Vaster Wilds. It is published by Riverhead Books. There is a, a very intimate relationship that this girl has with God. And the, as I said, the relationship that she has with religion. What did you want to explore? Because it it seems fascinating as as that relationship 
really transforms. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's I wanted that to happen. I think, you know, she is a person who has been a receptacle for received wisdom or received ideas. And she wasn't challenged out of those received ideas in London because she was really busy being a servant in a household that required a great deal of her. But when she is put under a great deal of strain in 1609, 1610 in Jamestown, where she's fleeing from, there was the starving time where something like 80% of all of the colonists died of either disease or brackish water or famine or violence. Uh, it was just a horrific time to be alive there. But she's fleeing from, from here. She has, as she leaves the what she thinks of as civilization behind, she has this understanding that perhaps the things that she was raised to understand are not necessarily the things that are necessarily closest to the truth to her. There's something about nature and being in nature that strips a lot of these received ideas from her, uh, as they do for me, right? As they do for anyone who goes for a hike for a long span of time with just, you know, a pack of water and a dog, maybe. Nature will do its subtle magic on your soul and, and will make you start to question the things that you take for granted. And I think that's some of the great beauty of being a hiker or a runner in, in the wild. As as you're reading the novel, it becomes, I mean, I assume this is intentional, but it becomes apparent that you are in some way addressing the pandemic that I assume you were writing this book during or very shortly after. What is funny, Joe, is that I had finished this book before the pandemic. Um, no, I did edit it over the course of the pandemic, but I really, I didn't. Uh, think of the pandemic at all when I was composing it or writing the many, many drafts that took to get to this point. I have traditionally been terrified of pandemics. And in fact, in a lot of my work, they sort of resurfaced. My first major published story in The Atlantic, uh, it was called Ildebar and Aliad back in 2006, and it's about the 1918 flu epidemic. Arcadia, weirdly published in 2012, it's my novel, it predicted COVID in some ways. There's right. Um, in, right in the book, there's a 2019 respiratory pandemic that kills a lot of people. I didn't mean to predict it, and I hope I didn't bring it into the world. But <laughs> if it did, I'm really sorry. But yeah, it's I, it's just something I'm I'm always worried about, and I think that the, whatever resonance that the pandemic has in this book maybe because of my incredible anxiety and fear about um, pandemics in general. What's fascinating about it and how you address it is that it shows our fragility. It shows yes. just how fragile we are as a species. As a species, as a culture, right? As um, just existentially, right? In both personal and larger forms. Yeah, we're really fragile. We are. And as as she is going through this and surviving, there is obviously the work which which you describe so beautifully about just trying to find food and whether that's a berry or a fish or honey and getting stung all over the place with bees. It it is this constant quest. And I, I'm curious as to how you research that and sort of look at, at ultimately how it sustains her and, and how it also leads to her kind of breaking down physically. Oh, my gosh. The research for this book was so joyous and wonderful <laughs> and fun and strange. You know, I have to admit to being a little bit of like a survivalist in literature. I don't know how long I would actually survive by myself in the wild, probably not very long, but I have a giant library of survivalist tomes. And so I, I did a, a lot of really fun reading about the different ways that you could create some sort of um, shelter for yourself out in the woods and how to bring water out of like the dew that's happening. So um what you actually need in order to to survive as long as you possibly can in the woods, like a, a some sort of fire, some hatchet, things like that. All of these things came out of this fixation on, um, I guess, survivalist literature. 
the even things like My Side of the Mountain, that children's book, which is so incredible and amazing, and Hatchet by um, Gary Paulson, and uh, even uh, television shows. I don't have a TV, but when I'm in a hotel room, I will always watch like Naked and Afraid <laughs> or something like that, <laughs> just because these stories are are balm for anxious people, especially people anxious about climate change. I think um, Bruno Bettelheim, the great uh, academic talks about fairy tales as being um, inoculations against the anxieties of the children who would sit there listening, where the worst thing that these children could possibly think of is starving to death and their parents putting them out in the woods that they have to crawl home or being abducted by a witch, right? The, these, these horrible right. things that could be happening in the lives of these children were through narrative some of the sting of the anxiety was was taken away or alleviated. And I think that that's what these survival narratives do for me in particular and a lot of other people as well. Given the the back and forth and even you alluding to the fact that you were writing them together, how, how do you see this book fitting in with Matrix? Because they, they do seem similar in a sense in, in that they they bring us to to very stark pared down times and places that allow us a lot of room to think and look around thank you for saying that so actually uh i envision these two books matrix set in the 11th century in an abbey in bastard wilds 1609 a girl 1610 a girl fleeing from jamestown and this third book that I'm currently writing and failing to write over and over and over again right now <laughs> as a very loose triptych. It's not a trilogy because there are no similar people, themes, styles, even the language is profoundly different. I worked with Medieval Trips and Matrix and uh, Bastard Wilds is an Elizabethan language and it's contemporary language in the third one. Uh, but all of these have these very similar thematic obsessions, right? There's the obsession of women and the cages that they're born into in these specific times, religion and what religion does to the people of the time, Um, the way that ideas of God are, have led us to this current day. And I, and I like to see them as almost a stone skipping across the water of time where the first place where it skips is matrix. And then, about 500 years later, it is uh, Bastion Wild. And then about 500 years later, it is the third book that is slowly killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not laughing at a book killing you, but I, 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 I understand that it's uh, obviously um, must be something that, that is uh, <laughs> forever a puzzle to solve, right? Absolutely. You mentioned the language, and I, I wanted to talk to you about this Elizabethan language that you use in the Vaster Wilds. This comes certainly through the dialogue, but it also is in the narrative form as well. And I'm I'm curious as to how you adopted that style and, and kept with it to to make it such a product of its time. Ah. Oh. Bless you. Well, um, one of the great joys of writing this book was the opportunity to go back to Shakespeare. And so right. I did, I went back and I reread all the great plays, you know, and the other thing as a working writer, it's glorious to read all of Shakespeare and to understand that even he wrote a stinker once in a while. <laughs> like, it's, really, <laughs> it's kind of amazing to know that the man who wrote King Lear also wrote, um, Pericles of whatever or time of Athens but I went back and I and I just paid attention to the meter the scansion the the way that metaphors flower differently than they do in contemporary English one of the things that I did I have so much fun writing my books Joe it's it's not all joy all the time but sometimes a lot of time it's it's very very fun and one of the early drafts, I decided just to throw up my hands and write the whole thing in I am. Not pentameter, but I am a um, rhythm all the way through. And that was so lovely. And it showed me so many things about this book. Because, of course, my, my character, my protagonist is running through the woods. 
and for some reason, I ams are for for my ear. There's it's a it's a running rhythm. It's a it it almost makes you lean forward, and it also showed me a great deal about pacing and uh, the ideas that came up. And it was it was one of the most strange and failed and glorious experiments I've ever done. One of the things I found fascinating, and and uh, hopefully you uh, won't think any less of me for for uh, pondering this for a moment, but. When you're reading it, you you get this. You're you're lulled into this time and place. So whenever you use the words p or sh, <laughs> it's a punch. And of course, Shakespeare could certainly be crude, was crude, in in many of the great works. But you use it quite a bit, and I'm I'm interested in that being a conscious choice of sort of waking you up or having it be really a- adopted as part of that Elizabethan language? Oh, it was so Elizabethan. They were so excited about the material world and about the the issues of the body, the biliousness and the um, the sanguineousness, right? I mean, they were so obsessed with a pee and poop. They were very frank in a way that we've gotten away from. I think uh, maybe, I don't know who to blame it on. I'm thinking maybe it was Queen Victoria, but um, <laughs> I, it, was, it was very much of the time to be obsessed with blood and pus and all of that stuff. But it's also just reality, right? I mean, she, sure. this is my protagonist. She is in the woods. The most urgent things uh, that she's going to be doing for a lot of run this run through the woods are going to the bathroom and trying to find things to eat. I mean, that is like that. If she doesn't do it, she dies. And and what relationship the food has on her as as to what as to how it's processed in the end, I, I think it comes at you interestingly. I, I it, every time I read it, I was a little surprised, and I I thought it was really cool. I'm glad. I know. Well, already there's a, I don't know if you know this, but there's this wonderful account on Instagram called the Prudes of Instagram, where apparently, I only know this because they tagged me, but they take uh, one star reviews of specific books. And um, this one person said that the, the piss fetish really drove her to write a one star review of this book. Which makes me laugh so much because there's also, you know, murder and cannibalism. In the book. <laughs> yeah, I certainly and, wouldn't call it a fetish, but OK. Like, yeah, like urine is the thing that you're not OK with. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I would like you to discuss the, the title because it, it does have Shakespearean roots. Oh, it does. Yes. I first encountered a similar idea as the vasty deeps in the wives of Bath, I believe is the, I, it, it happens, it recurs actually multiple times, the, the vasty deep um, or the vasty wild. And vasty is not a word that we uh, people of the 21st century would know, but vaster is, it's also something that blooms back into the book. If you think about it, um, deeply enough. It's it's about what's going on within the protagonist as well. When you look at this as you were saying a triptych, and I'm I'm curious, how long does it take you to get out of that that let's say, whether it be medieval or Elizabethan and then going into more contemporary language of of getting out of that headspace to write in another way entirely? Oh, not long at all. So this is what I do when I'm writing multiple books at once, which is always, um, I wake up in the morning early and I go upstairs and whichever book is calling to me is the one that I work on that day. And so it's the the radical reset of the long night because I go to bed at eight, (laughs) I sleep a lot. Um, (laughs) It, the radical reset is the thing that actually makes it possible to go from one kind of English language to another, one character to another, one story to another. I, I feel compelled to ask this, but do you wish you could write one book at a time or do you have to write multiple books at a time? 
Oh, heck no. I love writing multiple books at a time. And even if it's not multiple books, I'm writing short stories as well as novels, uh, always, no matter what. And those end up being, the short stories end up being a, a collection at some right. point, uh, like a thematically linked collection, usually. Uh, so, no, I mean, I think the beautiful thing about this is that um, most of the work of writing a book happens in your subconscious, which it might be a surprise for people who think that you're just like sitting there all day long, like laying sentence upon sentence like brick, like you're a mason. But the truth is almost everything happens as you're going about your daily businesses, you're showering or playing tennis or, you know, eating with your family. And uh, it, a lot of it happens as you sleep in your dreams or novels, fiction in particular, not necessarily, I think, nonfiction books. They work very differently. But at some point over the course of writing a book, uh, a novel, a short story, you you click into it, right? You, and the world sort of opens up to you so much so that anywhere you go, anything you do, that you're going to be um, given a gift from the universe uh, about something that needs to be in the book or needs to be changed in the book. It, 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 you, it's kind of this glorious moment where you start to feel like the world is conspiring with you to write the book. And it's because mm -hmm. you've taken the time and allowed your sub subconscious that time to develop the, the work and to fully allow yourself to get into it. I think it's, it's so fun. It's so fun to write multiple things at once. The latest thing you have written is The Vaster Wilds. It is published by Riverhead. Lauren Groff, it's always a great pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's a great pleasure for me, and I'm sad that this conversation is already over. Thank you. <laughs> Lauren Groff's new novel, again, is The Vaster Wilds. It is published by Riverhead. Thanks to our producer, Sarah LaDuke. Write to us at book at wamc.org. The latest on national productions programs is available via the Airwaves newsletter at wamc.org and on social media at WAMC Radio. Bookmark us for next week.